And we're going to talk about this relationship as being the children of God this morning as we open up the Word of God and we study God's Word together. If you want to go ahead and get a head start and open up your Bibles, pull it up on your phone to the Gospel of Mark and Mark chapter 9. We've been moving through this Gospel at a pretty good pace. I've loved looking at and exploring the life of Jesus in this particular gospel, I know that you've been encouraged as well. In 1902, J.M. Barry created the character of Peter Pan. You remember Peter Pan. It's the boy who refused to grow up. And in his plays and in his book, The Adventuresome uh, Peter Pan would fly about the mystical island of Neverland, and he would interact with fairies and pirates and mermaids and on occasion a few ordinary people. There is a medical, psychological condition called the Peter Pan syndrome. It afflicts people living today. It's a real thing. Peter Pan syndrome affects people who either don't have the capacity or don't want to grow up. They are children trapped in adult bodies. And as a result of this Peter Pan syndrome, these kinds of people, they, they lack discipline. They don't take responsibility. They don't make commitments. They are socially awkward. There's just something about their life that seems that they're stuck in a perpetual childhood. The, probably the most famous figure of this that you know of is Michael Jackson. You remember how as an adult, he lived most of his adult years on a 2,700-acre estate that he titled Neverland. You remember that? And, and Neverland not only had a house for Michael Jackson, but it also had a full theme park. There were roller coasters and a train that went through his property, and there was a carousel and a Ferris wheel and bumper cars and a water slide and cotton candy machine. There was all of this stuff. And when you first heard about Michael Jackson and Neverland some 25 years ago, I know what you thought. You thought, this is weird. This is just weird. Because we expect children to grow up. We don't expect adults to grow down. In fact, to say to somebody, stop acting like a child, that's not a compliment at all. And yet, when we turn to the life of Jesus, this is exactly what Jesus expects for his followers. And what you're going to hear Jesus say, in effect today, as we look at a couple of texts, is Jesus looks at his people and he says to them, I want you to start acting like children. If you want to Know me, and if you want to be welcomed into the kingdom of God, I want you to start acting like children. That's the theme of our, of our text that we're looking at today in Mark chapter 9 and another text in Mark chapter 10. You see, Jesus and his disciples had been in the northern territory around a region called Caesarea Philippi, and they have left that region, and they have traveled south to Capernaum. They have returned to Capernaum, which was the little village that was Jesus' home base for ministry. And Mark tells us in verse 33 that when they arrived into the city that Jesus asked his disciples who were with him, what is it that you are arguing about on the road? Mark adds a little bit of narrative content in verse 34. He says that Jesus had overheard his disciples arguing about which one of them was the greatest. I can, I can imagine how this argument took place. Peter and James and John were the holy trio that got invited up on the mountain. You remember that early in the chapter? And they had the opportunity to see Jesus uh, uh, you know, spectacularly transfigured before their eyes. And I'm sure that those three disciples came down the mountain. They found the other nine who had not been privy to that privilege. You know the nine who couldn't cast the demon out of the kid? And they came down and they shared with the others what they got to experience that the others did not. I suspect this wasn't the first time that the disciples had sized one another up, wondering who was the most privileged, who does God love best, who is the, who is the one that was the greatest among all of Jesus' followers. And so having come from Caesarea Philippi, now traveling to Capernaum, the days, several days' journey from one place to the other, they, they squabbled about themselves as to which one of them was the greatest disciple. And it was in that context, in verse 35, that Jesus sat down. That's the posture of a rabbi who's about to teach his, his students something important. Jesus sat down and he says in Mark 9, 35, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last 
and he must become the servant of all. Okay, that makes no sense to me. I mean, I got to tell you, if I want to be first, then I need to be first. If I want to be first on the airplane and get room in an overhead compartment, I got to jockey and move up to the front of the line. You, you, you know what I'm talking about? If, if you want to be first on the plane, you don't get in the back of the line. You don't go sit back down in the airport lounge. You don't want to be group five. You want to be group one or two. And so you move up to the front of the line. It makes absolutely no sense for Jesus to say that if you want to be first, you have to become very last, you have to be the servant of all. But, but what Jesus is doing in this text is he is communicating what he has communicated in various other places throughout the gospel. It's what we might call a kingdom inversion. God does not operate the way that we operate. God doesn't think and view life the way that you and I think and view life. There is a kingdom inversion. In fact, in other places, Jesus would say things like, if you want to gain your life, you got to lose it. What? If you want heavenly riches, you must be willing to experience and embrace earthly poverty. You want victory? Yeah, I want victory. Then you need to die. If you want to be first, then you have to be last. And if you want to be the greatest, then you need to get down on your knees and become a servant. Kingdom inversion. And what Jesus is teaching his disciples then and now is that, is, that, is that Jesus doesn't look at the world the way you and I look at the world. And the kingdom of God does not expect the kinds of things that we would expect in the kingdom of God. And having communicated this, this, this principle, Jesus now gives his disciples an object lesson so that they would understand. In verse 36, it says that Jesus took a little child and he had this child stand among the disciples. Taking the child in his arms, Jesus said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not just welcome me, but they welcome the one who sent me. And then if you'll move over to Mark chapter 10 and verse 13, Jesus communicates the same principle, a similar principle again. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them. But the disciples rebuked those people and the children. And when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. And so he said to his disciples, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms. He put his hands on them and he blessed them. No doubt you've seen classical paintings of this scene, maybe a poster in a Christian bookstore. Jesus is sitting on a rock, and the children are climbing up into his lap, and Jesus is all ooey and gooey with his arms around the children, and all the parents are standing around just going, oh, that's so cute, that's so beautiful. It wouldn't have happened like that. You, you see, in our day, or in Jesus' day, this picture of the kids climbing all over of Jesus would have been such a strange picture. In our day, in our contemporary world, we think much about our kids. In fact, everything in our lives, all of our, all of our home and all of our time is turned to center on our kids. People today organize their lives around their kids' schooling. They organize them around their kids' sports. They dote on their kids. They're helicopter parents. They manage their kids. They do everything that they can. In fact, much of the ministry of the church is, is focused on the children. And as we'll see in a few minutes, it should be. But one writer goes so far recently as to say, in contemporary culture, a parent's child can become their greatest idol. That's for another sermon. But we need to understand that, that Jesus and his disciples in an ancient culture didn't have the same view of children that we have. Children in an ancient culture would have never been allowed to come and interrupt a discussion. Children in an ancient culture would have had to wait to eat their meals. The adults eat first, the children eat what's left over. Children in an ancient culture were required to respect their adults, and they were not afforded the same rights even as adults. 
This is why when the disciples saw all of these little children come out of the village and climbing up in Jesus' lap and tugging on his cloak, that the disciples rebuked the children because it was beneath the dignity of such a distinguished rabbi to have these children all around. But as the disciples pushed the children away and said, no, 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 you can't, you can't come over here and talk to Jesus, Mark tells us that Jesus became indignant. That's the word he uses in chapter 10, verse 14. Jesus became indignant. The word here can be translated offended. And the reason that Jesus was indignant or offended at the disciples pushing the little children away is because Jesus says, the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. You might just underline that in your Bible. The kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Translation, the kingdom of God exists for this kind. These are the kinds of people that you'll see in the kingdom. And the reason you should welcome children, Jesus says, is because they are the kind that will be welcomed into God's kingdom. I don't know if you've ever thought about the kingdom of God, what it's going to be like when you and I walk through the gates, there's the kingdom of God. But what Jesus is communicating in this text is that when you and I walk into the kingdom of God and we start surveying the people in the kingdom of God, it's not going to be filled with people in which we say, oh, there's a great philosopher and there's a fantastic politician. That seems like an oxymoron. There's, there's a great business leaders. Here are the movers and shakers over here and the great minds and the, and the, the extraordinary heroes and the, and the people that, that accomplish so much, the rich people over there. He said, that's not... That, when you think of the kingdom of God, those are not the kinds of people necessarily that you'll see in the kingdom of God. What you'll notice when you walk in the kingdom of God is that it's going gonna, it's gonna to be kids everywhere. Kids everywhere. That's the picture. I don't think that's literally, but that's, that's the picture. The picture, the metaphor, the image of the, of the kingdom of God looks more like a school playground than it does an executive conf, conference room. Jesus says the kingdom of God belongs to this kind of person. And in fact, when you think of the way that God refers to you and you and you, that's his most oft description of his people. Sure, the Bible says that Christians are disciples of Jesus and followers of God, and we are the church, and we are his servants, and we are the bride of Christ, and we are the body of Christ. There's all kinds of designations of what it means to be a person that has their life aligned with God, but the most frequent description of the people of God is what? We're the children of God. He is our heavenly Father. We are his children. And it's an interesting designation when you really think about it. We are his children children. And in the two texts that Mark communicates, these two episodes in Jesus' life, in the context of disciples kind of standing up a little taller and puffing their chest out and thinking that they are something, Jesus says, I want you to start acting like children. What does that mean? What does it mean not to just be a child of God, but what does it mean to act like the children of God? What does it mean to start acting like children? What well, Jesus doesn't tell us very specifically in this text, but we can understand the broader context and understand what it means to start acting like children. Let me give you a couple, a couple of ideas. First of all, the children of God come to God humble. They come to God humble. Humility is one of the most important virtues of the spiritual life. In fact, Jesus in these texts doesn't just refer to a child, he talks about a little child, and I think that's significant. Because you can be 40 years old and be a child of your 75-year-old parent, right? You can be, that just is a reference of relationship. But when you say little child, that's not so much about your relationship as it is your position or your posture. You are down low as a little child, and you look up. My granddaughter, Junebug, she and I go for a walk, and I hold her hand. I realize she spends almost, almost all of her life looking up. Unless I get down on my knees and get down on her level, she spends all of her attention looking up. 
And the children of God, to be a true child of God, to act like a child of God, means that we have a constant reflection up in who God is. That means that we rightly assess ourselves, right? Because you don't look up if you think you're all that. It means you rightly recognize your smallness, your weakness, you, you recognize your limitation, you recognize that in relationship to God, you are small, He is great, great in every way. I've started teaching our, our annual course that we do every other year called CORE, and a couple of weeks ago we talked about the Tower of Babel episode in the Old Testament. Remember, remember that story in, in, in the book of Genesis? The people of God, uh, the people that God had created, decided that they were going to build a tower to reach God. And so they began to make man-made bricks. Now we're going to build a tower where God creates, we can create. God makes stuff, we make stuff. God is big, we can get big. That's what happens to people along the way. Our familiarity with God along the way, causes us to lose the distance. We start looking God eye to eye. Or maybe we look down on God and we don't think He's that important. We, we start to lose a sense of the majesty and the spectacularness of God. And God becomes quite ordinary to us. Not for a child. Those that are little children of God always are finding God awesome. He is awesome in His power. He is awesome in His presence. He is great in His mercy. He is, he is unmatched in His grace. He is extraordinary in His providence and in His sovereignty. To be a little child in the presence of God is to stand with your mouth wide open and just think, God, is amazing. And for some of us today, we need to rekindle a sense of the awesomeness of God to get down on our knees humbly before Him and say, Lord, there is no one like you. No one like you. We come to God humble. Secondly, a child comes dependent. Dependent. Dependency. The highest paid YouTube influencer of last year. Okay, these people who are, they go on social media and they advertise products or they do things that make uh, retailers a lot of money and they get paid for that. The highest grossing YouTube influencer of 2020 is nine-year-old Ryan Kaji. Ryan Kaji made $29 million last year. Makes you mad, doesn't it? Companies, toy stores send him free products, and he plays with those products on video and makes money doing that. $29 million. Now, let me tell you, Ryan may have made $29 million, but he did not make $29 million alone. Ryan needs his parents. His parents provide him food and shelter and medicine, and information, and security, and an internet access. Ryan can't go to the bank and draw out Ryan's money. He can't do that by himself. And he can't take his money and go to the store and spend it by himself. Ryan is wholly dependent on his parents. It may look from a distance that Ryan is self-sufficient, but he's not self-sufficient. He needs his parents for everything in life. And the true children of God understand their great need for God. There are no self-sufficient children of God. There are no self-sufficient children of God. In fact, the Apostle Paul says it rightly in Acts chapter 17, verse 28, when he's speaking about God and the greatness of God, he says this, in him we live and move and have our being. In him we live and move. We need him for everything, not just the big things. We need him for absolutely everything. 
And what some of us need today is to open our eyes and our hearts and not just be humble before the Lord, but say, Lord, I need you. I need you. I don't make money by myself. I don't make it to tomorrow by myself. Every breath that I breathe comes from you. I haven't accomplished. I haven't become victorious. I haven't succeeded this promotion by myself. My kids didn't become the great kids that they are by them themselves. I do nothing apart from the hand of God. And the true children of God are ever depending on God, saying, Lord, help, help. I appreciate the doctors you've put in my life, but God, I need your help for me to get well. God, I'm so grateful for the spouse that you put in my life, but I need your help to sustain a healthy and good marriage. God, I'm so grateful for the, for the, for the schools and the mentors that pour into my kids' life, but God, I need your help to watch over them for them to grow up and become the person that they need to be. God, I, we need you. We need you in our life. And I fear perhaps that If we get long enough in the spiritual life and we start doing things and accomplishing things, that we begin to think that we only need God for some things for life instead of for everything. The children of God come to Him moment by moment dependent on Him. There's a third virtue that really dovetails into this, and that is that children, by very nature, they come trusting trusting in God. Parents, this is the reason that you have to teach your children not to talk to strangers, because they are so naturally trusting. It's the reason you have to teach your kids to look both ways when they cross the street, because they just expect they step on the pavement, all of life stops and gives them clear passage. When you give your kid medicine, your kid doesn't go, whoa, whoa, time out, dad. Can you imagine a four-year-old doing this? Time out. Hold on just a second. We need to read the back and make sure there are no cross indications, right? Right? No, children just, based on the information they have, they move forward. They are naturally trusting. With the amount of information they have, which may be very little, they automatically trust. And when Jesus says to his disciples, I want you to not think about how great you are, I want you to think about how great God is, and I want you to come as a child, he says, he's meaning, I want you to be people of faith that depend on him. Even when there's things in life you can't make sense of, even when you can't see to the end of the situation, you can't see how something's going to end, I want you to constantly depend on God. I want you to trust him in faith. We talk about faith at the beginning of a spiritual life. That's what it means for us to first come to Jesus. But Jesus says, my children, trust me moment by moment by moment. Now, what is it? What is it that we are trusting Jesus for? Ever thought about that? What am I trusting? And I would say there are two things that we ultimately are trusting God for in our life. This will cover a multitude of concerns in your life. Two things. God is great and God is good. God is great and God is good. First, we trust God is great. That means that He has everything in control that we couldn't possibly have in control. That means that He can accomplish whatever He wants to accomplish. That there are no, that there are no concerns with God. God doesn't have any questions He can't answer. God doesn't have any actions that He cannot do. God can do absolutely everything. I can't, but He can. I recognize that God is great. Secondly, and these, these two things go hand in hand. They're so important together that God is good. Because if God was great but was not good, you and I'd be in trouble, right? And if God was just good but He wasn't great, well, then He would just be like a big old grandpa but doesn't necessarily can't do everything in life. But if I believe that God is good, that means He is for me, He is for Himself, He is for His purposes, that He only will do what is good, and I combine that with His greatness, listen, that's something I can trust in. That's something I can get behind, the greatness and the goodness of God. And so to come to God and to act like a little child is to say, Lord, I trust you. I trust you. I don't have all of the information. I don't know how this is going to end up, but I just trust you. And let me tell you how you know that you're not trusting. 
Okay? Let me tell you what it looks like to not trust God. I think there's three things that happen in our life almost simultaneously that, that are the indications of not trusting. It starts in our head, our thinking. It's called doubt. Doubt is, uh, it doesn't make logical sense to me. I can't put the pieces, I can't work the math out in my head. And so unable to really see the end of it, I just, uh, just not believing, I'm not trusting that that's possible. It starts in our head with doubt. It moves down into our heart with what? Worry, anxiety. What I doubt with my mind, I have anxiety about in my heart. I get all in knots and I begin to, it begins to affect the way I relate to other people and my isolation from the world. And I mean, I, th- that worry just gets inside of me and undoes me. And you know what? The doubt in your mind moving to the worry in your heart will almost always come out in your hands and your feet and your actions as control. I'm just going to take control. I'll, I'll fix this. I'll fix this. God tells me to be patient. Yeah, patience didn't work for me. I tried it for the last two minutes, and now I'm going to get busy and take care of things myself, right? We take control. Take control of people. Take control of our circumstances. Take control of our money. We take control of conflict. We just take control. When I experience doubt in my head, worry in my heart, control with my life. I'm not talking about self-control. I'm talking about being controlling. When those things come in concert with one another, I know I have lost the trusting of God, believing that he is good and he is great. Jesus said, I want you to start acting like children. I want you to trust me, trust me. Here's the last thing that it means to come to Jesus as children, and that is that we come growing, growing. You ever notice that children grow Adults just get older. You never find a 45-year-old person that says, you know what, when I grow up, they never say that. Children grow, but adults just get older. And when God calls us to be children, He calls us into a relationship with Himself where we have a vision of growing, of developing, of going beyond where we are. In fact, the Bible over and over again encourages the people of God to grow in the knowledge of the Lord, to grow up into all things that are Christ, to to, 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 to be in God's Word, to, to, to move further beyond, to experience maturity, ongoing life transformation. In fact, the Apostle Paul speaks to this idea in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Listen to this. He says, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, and when I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. You see, he says, there was a time in which I thought and reasoned and acted in a way that was childish, but I started, but then then I began began to grow. And growth is childlike. There's a difference between childlike and childish. Childish is immature, right? And there are some Christians that are quite childish in their spiritual life. But to be childlike is a desire to grow, the desire to grow up, to understand, to gain knowledge, to gain understanding, gain experience, to grow closer, to stretch and go beyond. That is the normal way of the spiritual life. True disciples of Jesus are not stuck in a state of perpetual immaturity. They Neither do they think they've fully arrived, okay? Don't even grow anymore. They are constantly like children, growing, maturing, developing in their spiritual life. And maybe for some of you here today, that's what's lacking. You love the Lord and you see Him as great and you bow your life. You're trusting Him along the way for your life, which is great. But there's just very little growth in your spiritual life. And Jesus would say to you, why don't you start acting like a child? Let's grow. And so we see in, in these things that there is quite a contrast between Jesus' expectation of his disciples and their estimation of themselves. They imagine that they had somehow already arrived. And Jesus says, no, 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 there's, there's a way to go. I want you to be humble like a servant. 
I want you to be dependent on me every single day. I want you to trust me. You may not have all of the information, but you believe that I'm good and I'm great. And I want you to continue growing in your spiritual life. What a significant difference that is from the way that we might view who we think are going to be in the kingdom of God. And the charge for God's people today is that we start acting more like children. Now, before we leave this text, let me just say that there are two associated principles that I just want to highlight for you that I think this text, as we think about it, and we think about Jesus pointing to children and talking about the kingdom of God belonging for that kind, I think it causes us to think about two other principles that are important. Number one, children are our best kingdom investments. Children are. And the reason that children are our best kingdom investments is because children are already living these principles by nature of just being children. Children are already, they already have a bit of humility. And you might say you haven't met my three-year-old. But they already have a big a sense of humility, a sense of what they're not and what they haven't accomplished yet. Children already have a sense of dependency. Children already have a sense in which they're, they're more trusting and there's less doubt and concern in their life. Children are already desiring to grow. And for that reason, children are a great spiritual investment for all of us. In fact, 50% of people come to know Jesus Christ personally before the age 13. 64% of people come to know Jesus Christ personally before 18, age 18. And 77% of people come to know Jesus Christ before their 21st birthday. Get that. 77%. Only 23% of the people come to know Jesus Christ as adults post 21 years old. And for that reason, it is good to invest in children. It's good for us as a church to invest in children. That's the reason we have so many staff people and we have so many volunteers investing in our children. It's the reason you find some of the greatest creativity coming out of our children's ministry. And it's not surprising that we see the vast majority of baptisms coming from where? Coming from our children. Because we're investing, we're putting our, some of our greatest resources in our children. And not just our elementary school children, but our junior high and high school students as, as well. I've been so proud of the kind of ministry that's being, that's being acted, acted upon in our, in our youth ministry. Students that are wrestling with real issues of the world, the spiritual Christian worldview that's being invested in the young men and the young women that are part of our junior and senior high ministry. That is our church's best investment. And parents, I would say to you, your kids are your best investment. Not your flower garden in the backyard, not your bathroom remodel, not your retirement account. Your best investment are your kids. And there is going to come a time, Tiffany and I have already experienced it, when they will be set free, whether you like it or not. And all that you have invested or haven't invested, and we even she and I can see the gaps and go, oh, I really wish, we'd have, wish we could have. But those, those opportunities will not be as great. They're not gone completely, but they will not be as great when your kids become as adult, adults as they are when they are at home right now. Invest in your children. And secondly, the second thing that I'd want you to hear in this passage is you must be born again. You see, there's no children without birth. That's the order of things, born, become a child. That's the way it works. It's the way the science is. And in the same way, the only way a person becomes a child of God is that they must experience a birth. And, and those two births, the birth to become a child of man and the birth to become a, a child of God, those are two separate births. Nobody be, is born naturally into this world as a child of God. Nobody. We hear people say sometimes, oh, we're all, everybody in the world, we're all children of God. Not true. It's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that everybody is a, children, is a child of a human being, but not everybody is a child of God. 
And the only way that a person becomes a child of God is through faith in God's Son, Jesus Christ. It's the only way. In fact, this is the way that the Apostle John states it in John chapter 1. He says, to as many who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave right to become children of God, children born not of a human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. That's a loaded verse. John tells us that the way we become children of God is not because of a human decision or a husband's will. It's not because of a natural childbirth that we become children of God, but through a supernatural work of God. And the only way that you and I encounter and enter into this supernatural work of God is by doing what? By believing in Jesus and receiving him into our lives. That's the only way. And there may be some sitting here, listening here, listening later, that have never trusted in Jesus Christ. Let me tell you quite plainly, you are not a child of God, but you can be. Because while you had no decision about being born the first time, you can have a decision in being reborn. And that is trusting in Jesus Christ. See, God sent a son, Jesus, into the world to do what? To take care of the problem of sin. Sin was the thing that separates us, every single person from God, And without that sin taken care of, there's no way that we could ever spend eternity in God's kingdom. But Jesus Christ came, lived a perfect life, took the sin of the world on himself and died in our place. He absorbed our punishment so that every person who trusts in him, every person that comes to him humble, in weak dependency, trusting in Him, desiring to grow and become the person that God designed you to be. The Bible says that when you trust Him in faith, you become born again. And friends, I I pray that if, I ask that if you have never made a decision for Jesus Christ and trusted Him by faith, would you do that today? Would you say, Lord, I need you. I'm a sinner. I want to be your child. Would you forgive me of my sin? And would you welcome me as a child into your kingdom? Our Father, thank you that you do welcome us. You throw the gates of your kingdom open and you say, come in, come in. But you don't receive those people who are self-sufficient. Got the tiger by the tail. Look how strong I am. I don't need God. You don't receive the people who trust in themselves rather than you. You don't receive people who don't care a bit about growing and becoming the people that you've designed them to be. You receive those who are like children. And so, Lord, would you hear the prayer of every person that says, Lord, I want to become a child of God. Would you forgive me of my sins and receive me into your care? And then, God, would you help every person who is a child of God to live like children of God, humble and dependent, trusting and ever-growing, And may you receive the glory as we act like children. In your name we pray, amen.